This episode of The History Guy brought to you by Drive a Tank. Stay tuned to the end of the episode for a special message. The Allied landings on the beaches of Normandy in June of 1944 were a seminal event. The images of soldiers storming the beaches and the stories of the desperate fighting occupied the Western press then and, well, even up to today. But the landings were just the beginning of a grueling campaign to retake France and assault Germany itself. And in the summer of 1944, the U.S. 3rd Armored Division was in the front of much of that fighting. And for much of that time in the very front was Staff Sergeant Lafayette Poole and the crew of the M4 medium tank in the mood. It is history that deserves to be remembered. The U.S. 3rd Armored Division was activated April 15, 1941, at Camp Beauregard, Louisiana. 600 officers and 3,000 enlisted men of Brigadier General George Patton's 2nd Armored Division were transferred to create the core of the new division. 3rd Armored Division veterans Frank Wolner and Murray Fowler said of Camp Beauregard in their 1945 book Spearhead in the West, 1941-1945, to the 3rd Armored Division. It was hot and dusty, well populated by insects and subject to a quickly changing climate of sunshine and showers. Truly, Beauregard was the original of that spot where a man could walk in the mud and have dust blowing in his eyes. Driving where, on a perfectly dry day, vehicles were known to sink hub-deep in the spongy soil of unit motor parks, the 3rd began training with just 20 M2 May West light tanks, so named because the twin turrets, one containing a 50 caliber and the other a 30 caliber machine gun, reminded tankers of the famous assets of actress May West. The public relations officer coined the nickname for the division, the Bayou Blitz. In June, as nearby Camp Polk was completed, the division moved. Wolner and Fowler dryly stated, the light tanks proceeded to the new area under their own power, a miraculous achievement. Organized as a heavy armored division, the 3rd Armored commanded two armored regiments, containing a total of four medium tank battalions and two light tank battalions. With attached units, including three armored infantry battalions, when fully constituted, the 3rd Armored included some 16,000 men. In mid-June, the first selectees, meaning men newly drafted under the selective service system, began to arrive. Among them was 21-year-old Lafayette Green Poole of Odom, Texas. He had tried to sign up for the Navy with his twin brother in 1937, but was refused due to an eye injury he'd received as a child. Poole was a successful amateur boxer, had been studying engineering at Texas College of Arts and Industries at Kingsville, Texas. But when the Army instituted a draft, he chose to enlist on June 14th. In a 1944 edition of Yank Magazine, Corporal Wilbert Richards described him. He was a tall, skinny guy with a bench nozzle. He got that in the Golden Gloves. Assigned to the newly formed 3rd Armored Division, Poole would have shared the experience of other selectees. Wolner and Fowler wrote, The procedure on selective reception was standard. They were met at the train, usually with a band. Relieved of their luggage, given a hot meal and a bath, and assigned to bunks. Basic training, 13 weeks of it, was the order of the day. New recruits to the armored force found that hitting a target was no miracle and that road marches became easier with practice. There was plenty of the latter. At the time, selectees were only required 18 months service when the nation was not at war, and Wolner and Fowler noted the song was I'll Be Back in a Year, Little Darlin', and Ohio was a watchword that meant over the hill in October. But the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in December of 1941 meant that these selectees would not, in fact, be home in a year. Poole was initially assigned to the 40th Armored Regiment, although that regiment was dissolved in 1942, and he moved to the 32nd. When the division planned to send a group of boxers to a Golden Gloves competition in Chicago, Yank Magazine wrote, there was the beginnings of a legend about Poole even then. He'd won the sectional 165-pound crown at New Orleans, Louisiana that year, but turned down an offer to go on to Chicago in the National Final Golden Gloves Tournament. The reason? Poole was a tanker first and a boxer second. His outfit had just been allotted a few of the latest medium tanks. These tanks, the M3 medium, represented quite an improvement over the light and almost comically ill-designed May West M2s. Wolner and Fowler said of them it was unthinkable to these men that Germany, winding up a whirlwind campaign in France and the Low Countries, actually possessed more advanced machines for the waging of total war. They would come to find out that that assessment was incorrect. 
Before reaching the European battlefields, the men of the 3rd would be equipped with more capable M4 Shermans. Still, Wollner and Fellner noted, the later Sherman and Pershing tanks were a vast improvement over earlier models. But aside from greater maneuverability and mechanical endurance, never approached the excellent armor and ordnance of the German Panther and Tiger tanks. In July of 1942, the division was sent to the Desert Training Center in California. All the vehicles were taken by train because, Wollner and Fowler noted, rubber was too precious to waste in the undertaking. Their pool, by then a sergeant, gained a reputation as an aggressive and exacting tank commander. Offered an opportunity to attend officer training, he refused, preferring to remain a non-commissioned officer so as to remain closer to the front and the action. His response was quoted in the 2020 edition of Warfare History Network. I just want to have one of the best tank crews in the division. The desert was so hot that the men's lips chapped painfully, and they took to wearing crimson lipstick as a cure. But Wollner and Fowler argued that desert maneuvers of 1942 probably did more to toughen the third and prepare it for ultimate combat than had all previous training. Still, the division and its many elements underwent more training and served in more posts before shipping out to the United Kingdom, starting in September of 1943. Shortly before shipping out, Poole was promoted to staff sergeant. According to the Texas State Historical Association, Poole boarded a train bound for New York Harbor on September 4th and departed the next day aboard the liner Cape Town Castle, which arrived in Liverpool on September 15th. He was billeted at Codford in Wilshire, and the unit continued to train on the Salisbury Plain. The division arrived on the beaches of Normandy just a few weeks after D-Day in mid-June 1944. Poole's tank, an M4A1 medium tank mounted with a 75mm main gun, was assigned to Company I of the 32nd Tank Regiment. Poole had named the tank In the Mood, the name of a popular Glenn Miller song at the time. According to the Texas State Historical Association, when asked why, he replied, That's the way I felt then, just in the mood for anything. Part of Combat Command A, he was one of the first medium tanks of the 3rd Armored Division to enter combat near the French hamlet of Vieux Fossard on June 29th. The village was well defended and the job of Combat Command A difficult. But, the website of the 3rd Armored Division veterans writes, Poole seemed to be a natural to mechanized warfare. In his very first engagement, his tank, in the mood, was responsible for the destruction of over 70 German soldiers and three armored vehicles. He quickly became known as the Texas Tanker. Of course, armored combat is a team sport. The crew of In the Mood included driver Corporal Wilbert Red Richards, whom Yank Magazine described as a pint-sized GI from Cumberland, Maryland. Only 5 foot 4 inches tall, Poole referred to him as Baby, but according to the Warfare History Network, Poole considered him to be one of the best tank drivers in Europe and bragged that he could parallel park that big Sherman in downtown New York in rush hour traffic. Assistant driver and bow machine gunner PFC Bent Close of Portland, Oregon, was called Schoolboy since he was just 17 years old. Gunner Corporal Willis Uller of Morrisville, Illinois, was known as Groundhog because of the stains on his face from constantly wearing tanker's goggles, while loader Del Boggs of Lancaster, Ohio, was called Jailbird since, Warfare History Network notes, he was given the choice of the army or prison after a manslaughter charge. Poole's nickname, by his own account, was War Daddy. But their success in the Battle of Vie Fossard was cut short, as the In the Mood was disabled by a Panzerfaust, an infantry anti-tank weapon. It was one of 31 tanks of the 3rd Armored Division that was lost in the difficult fighting, although despite the losses, they did manage to liberate the town. Still, the crew of In the Mood was uninjured, and just two days later were back in another tank. Unlike the first tank, In the Mood 2 mounted the high-velocity 76mm gun. While its outer personnel round was not as effective as the 75, the 76 packed a stronger punch against German armor. Poole, although a non-commissioned officer, filled the role of a platoon commander and was notorious for taking the lead. Richard was quoted in Yank Magazine. The guys used to draw straws to see who'd lead the spearhead. Poole would have none of that, and he'd just say, I'm leading this time, in his old Texas drawl. Stand there grinning while we cussed him out. By God, I think we were more scared of Poole than of Jerry. Richards also told the reporter all Poole wanted was to get out ahead of the other tanks so he could kill more Jerry's. And that he did. In action, as in the ring, Poole punched hard and accurately, Yank crowed. It was great stuff for Poole. He was proving to himself and to the world that the American soldier is more than a match for Hitler's supermen. 
as the 3rd Armored Division took the lead. Some argued that they're the first to break out of the Bocage country, although some dispute that. A reporter from the Chicago Tribune gave them a new nickname, the Spearhead Division. Wooler and Fowler wrote, the officers and GIs who didn't look like heroes, but who were heroes all the same. They were lean and tired, hard as spring steel, red-eyed from the swirling dust, their faces lined and stubbled with whiskers. No time to clean up, no time to do anything but fight and go forward. The men of the spearhead had a job to do, and they did that job well. But if the 3rd Armored Division was the spearhead, Lafayette Poole and the crew of In the Mood were the tip of that spear. Yank Magazine noted that Poole thought that he could beat the Wehrmacht, gun to gun, and man for man. If the German armor was superior, Poole and the crew of In the Mood didn't acknowledge that. Outside the village of Columbier, a German panther rolled directly in front of the tank. A startled German gunner fired twice, but missed both times. Aller's aim was true, where History Network writes, a single round penetrating the turret and detonating ammunition inside. The panther's turret blew completely off in a burst of flame and smoke. But the fight wasn't over. The website of the Association of Third Armor Veterans writes, As it turned out, they had driven into a veritable armored hornet's nest. Remnants of the 2nd Panzer Division were reconnoitering the area. Firing began at once, and the enemy seemed to come from everywhere. Colonel Richardson, commander of the 32nd Regiment, could hear the orders and the swearing from the crews as they frantically tried to adjust to the unforeseen encounters. By dark, it was all over. Poole and In the Mood had taken out two enemy tanks and at least two armored cars. Dismounted German crews were fed lead for a late supper by machine gunner Close. Richard said of Poole, he used to sit up there in the turret. You could just tell Poole anywhere by the way he sat up there, more out than in. He rode that tank like a Texas bronc. Well, he used to sit up there and give us orders through the intercom phone, just as cool and calm as though the big show were a maneuver. Yank writes that Richards recalled a night when the spearhead had driven deep into German lines from Origny in France. It had become quite dark when the order finally came to halt. Poole opened his mouth to say, driver, halt, but found himself looking at a big Jerry dual-purpose AA gun in the gloom ahead. He said, gunner, fire, and Aller, with his eye perpetually pressed into the sight, squarely hold the enemy weapon before its crew could recognize the American tank. In the Mood 2 lasted until August 17th, when an Allied P-38 aircraft mistook the tank for German armor. Knocked out by friendly fire, the crew again was unharmed and christened In the Mood 3. They continued racking up kills. Warfare History Notes writes that outside Namur in Belgium, Poole and his men destroyed 16 enemy vehicles in one day, including half-tracks, assault guns, and several self-propelled anti-tank guns. Yank Magazine writes that outside the town of Dizon near Liege, after finding and destroying six armored infantry vehicles, Poole discovered that the head of his column had been fired upon by a German Panther tank. Hurriedly, he gave orders to his driver to regain the column. Upon arriving at the scene of action, he immediately observed the enemy tank and gave a single estimate of range to Aller. The gunner fired one armor-piercing projectile at 1,500 yards to destroy the panther. From the day of the great breakthrough in Normandy, Yanka pined, they had smashed the Wehrmacht before them, burned its vehicles, decimated its troops. These men seemed impervious to German shells. Twenty-one times they had led the irresistible drive of the American armor and remained unscathed in this most hazardous task of total war. The next target was the Siegfried Line in Germany itself. By that time, the Association of Third Armored Division Veterans notes, Poole had been awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, the Legion of Merit, and the French Croix de Guerre with Gold Star, and he'd been twice nominated for the Medal of Honor. It was there, on September 19th, against the German defenses, that In the Mood 3's luck ran out. Yank writes that watchers, including his colonel, who also rode in a tank, saw the bright lance shaft of a German tracer hit the turret of In the Mood. Struck by the anti-tank gun, Poole ordered the tank to reverse, yelling, Back up, baby! into the intercom. But a second hit threw Poole from the turret, and, trying to back away, in the mood fell over an embankment and rolled over. Poole's leg was shattered by a fragment of the shell. Richards later told a Yank reporter, I think Poole would have gone back himself if the medics hadn't held him down. There ain't a jerry shell in the world that could kill old Poole or any of his crew. The best those squareheads could do was to wound him in the leg. He'll be back and then God help the Panzers. Richard's assessment was optimistic. Poole's leg was too damaged to save, and he had to be amputated. For him, the war was over. In a period of just 81 days, Poole and his crew accounted for 12 confirmed enemy tank kills, 258 other armored vehicles and self-propelled guns, and he killed more than 1,000 German soldiers, captured 250. 
Poole's tank led his task force in at least 21 major attacks. The Texas tanker and his crew came to be called the U.S. Tank Ace of Aces. Poole returned to the United States where he was fitted with a prosthetic leg. He was discharged in 1946, but in 1948 he was allowed to re-enlist and served as a mechanic with the Transportation Corps and later as an instructor again with the 3rd Armored Division. He served until 1969 and retired as a Chief Warrant Officer too. He attended San Angelo College, eventually became a junior high school teacher. One of his sons, Jerry Lynn Poole, served as an officer with the U.S. Special Forces. He was killed in Vietnam. Lafayette Poole was the inspiration for Brad Pitt's character in the 2014 war film Fury. As an homage, that character was also nicknamed War Daddy. America's tank Ace of Aces passed away on May 30th, 1991, in Colleen, Texas, at the age of 71. He is buried in Fort Sam Houston National Cemetery. Special thanks to Drive a Tank of Casota, Minnesota, who let me drive their M4A3 HVSS and many more armored vehicles. Grab five or 20 of your best friends, pop off to Casota, and have the time of your lives. More information at driveatank.com. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you have to do is subscribe.